Hello and welcome back to Frampton Unplugged, the future of everything. So we're already on episode three and today uh, the theme is all around uh, the future of organisations and the fact that I believe that organisations or the businesses that we work in, where we go to work every day, are broken. So my thesis for today is that organisations are broken. Um, so if you look at some of the statistics out of there, um, last year YouGov published a survey that showed that only 17% of people love going to work. So you may not expect many people to love going to work, but if you think about that, that's less, what, less than one in five people actually really get excited about going to work, um, which is a pretty kind of damning statistic. If you then look at the number of people that say they hate going to work, um, or people that are neutral about going to work, it's nearly 36% of people. So um, almost twice the amount of people that love it actually don't love it. Um, and then if you are actually look at the number of people that are engaged, the number can be anything from between 60% to 75% of people saying that they're actually just sitting at their desk doing their job. So this is pretty kind of damning when you consider most of us spend most of our life at work. So what's going wrong? Well, I think it's down to the fact that um, we've built organisations over the last 50 to 100 years um, for the old world and the world's changed. Um, not only do we have different generations of workforce uh, kind of in our organisations today, but we've also in the last 20 years got radically different technology and radically different ways of engaging with each other outside of work. So the way that people experience things has changed dramatically. Um, the way that actually people kind of spend time with each other outside of work has changed dramatically. But yet inside work, we still manage people. We have managers, we still direct people, we have directors, we have structures, we have targets, um, we have departments. All of these things are not conducive to getting the most from people. And actually, um, if you think about kind of what humans um, kind of love doing best, and there's a great book um, that is due to come out um, a little bit later this year um, by Dan Cable, um, is his name, um, which I saw from uh, Bruce Daisley and Sue Todd's great Culture 2.0 conference. He's written a book around being alive at work. I mean, he talks about the fact that people don't get excited by doing the dull routine drudgery. Surprise, surprise. What they get excited by doing is by experimenting, by exploring and doing creative things. Um, so if that had been the case, then why do we have organisations where most people are just told what to do? This is what I want you to do. Do it by this time. Deliver it to me by this time. It doesn't kind of seek the best uh, from people. and It doesn't focus on the whole self. So interestingly, if you think about kind of artificial intelligence and all of the machine learning that's coming towards us. A lot of people are pretty scared about that and think, well, that will kind of take all my jobs away. But if you put it in a different context, think about the fact that it could take away the drudgery, it could take away the routine and, and actually allow people to kind of focus on their higher purpose, on being more creative, on planning, on strategizing and on thinking about different ways to crack uh, kind of problems within business. Another bugbear of mine, which I've been in conversation with some of you on LinkedIn around, is around human resources. Um, why today, in 2018, do we still call um, the department that's meant to look after our talent the most important people in the business, given most businesses are human capital? -led? Why do we call it human resources? It's like putting a number on people's head. Um, and let's face it, human resources um, is a term that was created in corporate life, um, where actually it services the leadership team in terms of the people that are required to do a job. And of course that's important. We need talent and capabilities to deliver against business goals. But in 2018, is that the best way to really motivate uh, and kind of think about getting the most from talent? Um, we should really be thinking about kind of people teams, talent teams, and how those people are developed. I think there's a huge kind of under kind of serving of talent within organisations and how they get kind of invested in. And actually, if you look at millennials, um, something like 66% of millennials say that they've already got a plan to leave the business by 2020. So they're already planning to leave. And the reason that they say they're planning to leave is that three and four of them say that their leadership is not being invested in. They're not getting anything from the company they're in. They don't think they're going to make an impact where they are. So they've already got a plan to leave. Um, but it's not just uh, kind of young people. I think you're seeing increasingly kind of more leaders and kind of more directors leaving corporate life. 
I'm quite a good example of that, uh, where you start to get kind of disenfranchised and disillusioned with kind of the way things are done and believe that there must be a slightly better way of doing things. Um, we're all on this kind of rat race of making sure we deliver against deadlines, we go to meetings, and are meetings the best way to get things done? Interestingly, Bruce Daisley, who I mentioned earlier, the MD of Twitter, talks about the kind of constant email kind of hitting you all day long as a motorway with only one lane. You can't get off it. Um, whether you're at home, in the evening, at the weekend, your email is there pinging at you and your boss kind of doesn't think about kind of what you might be doing at that point in time. So all of these things kind of build up to the fact that organisations must need to change. And I mentioned in my first uh, vlog a great book uh, that I read early on this year uh, by Frederick Leloup uh, called Reinventing Organisation. And he thankfully offers up um, kind of some solace for this situation because he suggests that there is a different way. Um, and he's interviewed many companies across the world and found new organisations which he calls teal organisations or organisations that are very authentic where they don't necessarily have pyramid structures, they don't have one leader at the top, they're much more self-managed, self-empowered and they find a different way, um, not a way that is either kind of driven by consensus or by authority making a decision autocratically. They actually start to think about, well, if anybody that has a stake in a decision is allowed to give their say, whether that's the CEO, the director, a manager, an assistant, if everybody is asked if it actually affects them, then you'll get a better, much better outcome. Um, the, other, the other kind of tactic or kind of methodology that he talks about is one called holacracy, um, which is a lot more fixed, structured way of getting an organisation to work in a much more fluid way. Uh, it's not what I'm going to talk a lot about here, but it's worth going and having a little look at it. So one thing I've done a lot of thinking about is why are there not more British organisations that have gone through this change and are kind of uh, challenging the way an organisation is structured. Uh, Frederick's book um, picks up on many Nordic companies that are looking at different ways of doing things, many German companies, but there's not many in the UK. And actually at a recent event, um, I asked a question um, and a company that was put forward was Timpson, so the guys that do kind of shoe repairs and key cutting. Apparently all of their people are allowed to kind of set the pricing uh, in their own stores. So I guess that's a form of kind of a different way of kind of giving authority down to uh, kind of the people on the ground rather than it being developed by leadership. But there are very few examples Examples. Um, and I have a theory about why that is. Uh, British uh, kind of business is very much driven by tradition. If you look at Meaningful Brands, which was the Havas study uh, from the business I used to work in, or uh, the more recent uh, brand finance study, previously in the last five to ten years, the businesses that came at the top of that survey were always kind of traditional kind of businesses. Many, many of them in retail, Marks and Spencers, John Lewis, businesses like that. Um, and I believe that British culture has got a real kind of addiction to tradition, which is not a bad thing, but I think in business, that means that they are kind of less willing to take risk. Tradition is held in more kind of higher worth than innovation. Um, and there aren't many examples of businesses where you can look at them and go, they've really kind of reimagined themselves from the inside out uh, when it comes to kind of British businesses. If you also look at the age of the average CEO in the UK, uh, the average CEO coming into a new role is nearly 50 and the average director is 59. So if you're a director of a business in the UK and you're 59, um, you were kind of in your mid 40s when Facebook was invented. You were 53 when Snapchat was invented. So are you necessarily kind of really at the cusp of what is changing in society? Technology is driving so much change and yet so many of our businesses are run by people that arguably you could cl claim are out of touch. If you look at the US, the SP500, uh, um, actually the businesses that have got younger CEOs are the ones that are growing faster now. Again, you could argue that's because they're tech businesses and tech businesses are of uh, kind of, of, of the now. Um, but there's something really interesting around why British business can't change fast enough. And I think we need to kind of challenge tradition. We need to challenge kind of hierarchy and the fact that kind of directors uh, and boards need to be made up of kind of all kind of, kind of people from the uh, kind of older business generation and largely the kind of male, pale, stale generation. So if you've been tuning in for a while, you'll know that I'm a big fan of younger leaders. Um, and 
I believe that we need more younger leaders that will be more bold um, and can, to kind of take more risks. Uh, I think we also need kind of younger leaders that don't have the shackles of yesterday. They don't uh, believe that you need to direct and manage in a certain way to structure businesses in a siloed manner. Um, and that processes and decision making will be managed in a very different way uh, by kind of uh, the next generation. Uh, so I think it's really important that we push more of that younger leadership up um, into those roles so that we can start to challenge the way organisations organizations are created. But of course many organizations will be continue to run by my generation and the kind of generation underneath the millennial generation. Um, so what can we do differently to make sure that kind of we reimagine organizations and make them places where people want to come to work, where people love the idea of coming to work. So um, I've got a simple kind of mechanic for remembering it um, which I call braver. Um, so firstly I think leaders need to be bold um, they need to be brave and to take kind of risks and think differently about business going forward. Um, they then need to be real, they need to be authentic, they need to be on the ground, part of uh, kind of the day-to-day -day life of a business, not in their ivory tower. Um, they then need to be adaptable. Business is changing, technology is disrupting and changing business every day. So adaptability is going to be an absolutely critical uh, kind of skill for going forward. Um, the next is vulnerability, actually showing that sometimes you haven't got it right and talking to your team around where you've made mistakes that is a kind of very kind of valuable kind of attribute and one I think millennials um, particularly will expect to see um, in their businesses going forward um, the next is empathy empathetic actually kind of really building your emotional intelligence know what's going on in the room understand people's kind of issues at home as well as their issues at work and think about how you can help them solve a problem rather than just force them um, to kind of keep delivering and keep delivering and then the last one the last R is resilient um, so with all of the change that's going on with disruption and kind of faster kind of change and probably businesses not lasting as long as they did in the past resilience will be a really key value so um, it's quite an easy thing to remember you'll see it up on the screen so braver b-r-a-v-e-r so thanks as always for tuning in um, i hope you found it um, interesting and valuable please if you have comment below give me your thoughts not everyone agrees with the kind of theory of how organizations need to change some believe maybe it won't change fast enough and we just have to live with it but i'd love your comments so comment below um, i'll also put in some of the kind of footage from uh Frederick Leloux, there's an interesting video. If you don't want to read the whole book, I'll put that in the comments below. Um, and if you liked the video, then give me a thumbs up. Um, and lastly, I've just launched an Instagram channel called Frampton Unplugged, um, at Frampton Unplugged. And on there, you'll find some kind of short form videos, kind of short cuts of some of the content that I've created here. And also some kind of inspirational leadership quotes I'll put out there once every day. And if I'm on the road and I hear something interesting, I'll also just share a kind of view quickly on camera as I'm walking around. So hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I look forward to seeing you next time. Frampton out.